And welcome to Enzyme Mental. I'm Jason Carter. How many of you have been told to reduce your salt intake as much as possible? Salt has been unjustly demonized for decades, and the research surrounding its supposed detriment to human health is extremely convoluted and very contradictory. And actually, such demonizing of salt for all these many decades has made us ignore the real problem in our food supply, and that, of course, is sugar. So as we all know, salt consumption has been said to raise blood pressure, cause hypertension, and increase the risk of premature death. This is why the Department of Agriculture's dietary guidelines still deem salt the most villainous culprit of America's decline in health, coming actually before fat, sugar, and alcohol. The current low-salt guidelines limit us to 2,300 milligrams of sodium, basically one teaspoon of salt, per day. It's even lower at 1,500 milligrams, or two-thirds of a teaspoon of salt, if you're older, African-American, or have high blood pressure already. Salt seems to be a very easy target because of the simplicity and what you might even call the sound plausibility of the salt blood pressure hypothesis. The idea of salt's deadliness sounds reasonable because it's theoretically convenient. The theory is that as one eats more salt, the body retains water to maintain a stable concentration of sodium in your circulation, and this explains why eating salty foods tends to make us thirsty, which makes us drink more and thus retain more water. This results in a temporary increase in blood pressure, which persists until our kidneys eliminate both the salt and the water. And on paper, it all makes sense initially, but it's really only just an educated guess. The truth is that the benefits of a low-salt diet have never been proven, and instead hold more potential to magnify the risks of heart disease. Low salt intake leads to things like increased heart rate, compromised kidney and adrenal insufficiency, hypothyroidism, higher triglyceride, cholesterol and insulin levels, and ultimately insulin resistance, obesity, and type 2 diabetes. Eating as little salt as the USDA and CDC recommend can be very harmful and increase our likelihood of dying prematurely. This forces us to question whether the single and largely minuscule potential benefit of a reduction in blood pressure is worth disregarding the mountain of health risks caused by low salt intake. Chronic salt depletion is likely a factor in what endocrinologists term internal starvation. So what this means is that when you start restricting salt intake, the body starts to panic. As a defense mechanism, the body increases insulin levels because insulin helps the kidneys retain more sodium. Ultimately, high insulin levels also lock energy into your fat cells, leading to more trouble with breaking down stored fat into fatty acids or stored protein into amino acids. When insulin levels are elevated, the only macronutrient that you can efficiently utilize for energy is carbohydrates. The fast food industry has hijacked and manipulated this process for decades. We've all been told time and again that salt raises blood pressure, which in turn increases risk of strokes and heart attacks. Looking at population data, however, it's evident that high salt diets don't seem to cause strokes and heart attacks at all. If anything, the research shows that high salt intakes lower the risk of cardiovascular disease and premature death. As just one example, the average Korean eats over 4,000 milligrams of sodium per day. Yet Koreans somehow manage to have one of the world's lowest rates of hypertension, coronary heart disease, and death due to cardiovascular disease. This is known as the Korean paradox. And you could easily swap out Korean for any one of other countries and see evidence of this paradox. The Mediterranean diet has been deemed heart healthy, but it's very high in salt also. And the French eat just as much salt as Americans, and yet they have a lower rate of death due to coronary heart disease also. Norwegians actually eat more salt than Americans, and yet they have a lower rate of death due to coronary heart disease, and even Switzerland and Canada have low rates of death due to stroke, despite their high salt diets. 
Hiding in plain sight during the entirety of this controversy sat insulin resistance and diabetes, both consistently found to coincide with retention of sodium in the kidneys and the development of hypertension or high blood pressure. In other words, what causes diabetes can also cause hypertension, and that dietary substance that causes diabetes, if I haven't told you enough already, is sugar, not salt. High sugar consumption leads to high insulin production by the pancreas. High insulin levels have been shown to stimulate the reabsorption of sodium by the kidneys. So in other words, rather than excreting salt in urine, those with diabetes would hold on to salt in their bodies longer. Additionally, insulin interferes with the pump that regulates the amount of sodium in our cells. So in this way, this sodium pump can also become insulin resistant. Sugar increases both blood pressure and heart rate. As far back as 1964, researchers were able to show over and over again that abnormalities found in patients with coronary heart disease, which would be elevated lipids, insulin, and uric acid, and also abnormal platelet function, could be caused by just a few weeks on a high sugar diet. But somehow, the blame continued to focus only on salt. The kind of salt that humans have been consuming since day one for most of human history is sea salt. It's not table salt. Sea salt provides all of your minerals in microscopic amounts that easily enter the body at the cellular level. Hopefully now you can see the deception that's been played on all of us for so many years linking all salt, including sea salt, with table salt, which is merely just sodium. I've said for many years that comparing sodium to sea salt is like comparing a steering wheel to an entire car. Your kidneys monitor your blood at all times. They ensure that there's a proper supply of minerals in the blood, and when there's a deficiency of minerals in the blood, you tend to crave salt. And this often happens when we sweat, after a long workout or during the summertime when we're exposed to more sun and heat. And so when this happens, the best thing you can do is put some sea salt in water and drink it. But what most people do is they reach for a salty carbohydrate, like a bag of chips, to satiate that salt craving. Salt is one of the cravings you absolutely want to give into, but it's about how you give into it. And the best way to do it, that's also cheap and easy to find, is put sea salt in water and drink it. And maybe start out with about a third to maybe a half a teaspoon of sea salt to one glass of water. What you'll notice over time is that you have better joint function, you're much less fatigued, you can move around a lot easier, and you have a better sustained level of endurance. And this is all because of the minerals in sea salt. You need every one of those minerals every single day, and sea salt gives them to you in an appropriate food-based dose that's easy for the body to absorb naturally. But of course, as we know, this isn't often brought up when someone has high blood pressure. They tell you to watch your sodium intake, and they tell you the best way to do that is to avoid all salt. Hopefully I've shown you today, guys, that, that this is terribly wrong. We need salt, and we don't live very long without it. Thanks for watching. I'm Jason Carter, and I'll see you next time on Enzyme Mental. Stay healthy.